Welcome to another weekend message. I'm Pastor Bill Thomas of Hereford Faith and Life Church. I'm so glad that you're watching this. Uh, I know as I talk to people, uh, we have folks in uh, New York, we have folks in New Jersey, uh, we have even some folks in Europe that are watching uh, this message, and we are greatly touched by that. We really want you to feel part of our church family, so please engage. Go to our website, herefordumc.com, and uh, you'll see there ways to uh, get on our mailing list, get our daily devotionals, uh, look at some of the ministries we're doing. Uh, we have a Wednesday night Zoom Bible study, and you can be a part of that no matter where you live. And even if you go to another church, you can certainly uh, come and be a part of that with us. We're, we're glad you're here. And we're glad, too, for your gifts and your support. It's really a meaningful time for us as we uh, go through, uh, like everybody, the post-COVID time, as we go through uh, the challenges that we have. Uh, it's your faithful giving that keeps us sharing Jesus Christ and touching people's lives. And we're, we're grateful for that. This Sunday also we'll be doing a communion. And so uh, I'll have a communion ready at the end of this message. So you might wanna pause the, the video here and make sure you have your elements ready uh, for you and your family, wherever you might be uh, to take communion with us. Well, before we get started, I wanna pray and uh, also explain uh, a little bit about what we're doing uh, this weekend, but let's pray first. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your love, for your mercy, for your care, for your protection, for your provision. You are almighty God. You are our God, our Lord, our Savior. We thank you for Jesus Christ who you sent. And he uh, is uh, the, the passion of our lives. Without him, we are nothing. And uh, because of him, we're your children. And we're going to go to heaven and be with you forever. Lord, I pray that you would open our spiritual ears that we might hear your word, Holy Spirit, come and anoint this message, that it might change our lives. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Well, let me share screen with you and explain uh, what is happening. Uh, this is uh, Pentecost Sunday, and uh, Pentecost uh, is a time for us when we graduate our confirmation class. We have four confirmants who will be uh, renewing their vows uh, of baptism. In fact, one of the conferences will be baptized, and then they'll take the vows of church membership, becoming part of uh, Hereford Faith and Life Church, and uh, we're grateful. And uh, I wanted to give a message that uh, was not so much targeted to them, but just really it touches all of us. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I'm glad, I'm glad for a lot of things. One of the things, I have teenagers in the house, and I'm glad of that because uh, I get to hear uh, their hearts. I get to hear what uh, is on a teen's mind in this crazy world that we live in, and it reminds me of how powerful God can work through young people. Uh, the Old Testament book, Second Chronicles, King Amon was one of the most wicked, vile kings that uh, Israel ever had. Uh, he was the king of Judah. Uh, he, he was just wicked, he, was, uh, he pulled people away from God. He uh, worshiped idols and really promoted paganism uh, throughout uh, the, the, the holy land that God had given uh, the Israelites. And uh, he was so wicked, as a matter of fact, that his closest advisors and friends actually plotted and assassinated him. And uh, that left his son, Josiah, to rule Judah. Now, Josiah was eight years old when he was crowned king. And remember, Josiah was raised in a completely godless home, a pagan environment. But listen to what it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verses 1 and 2. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor David. He did not turn aside from doing what is right. Now, you kind of be deeply impressed that uh, this young child at eight years old knew how to do right and how to please God. And this should be a wake-up call for all of us that inside every child, no matter what home environment, every child has a tender place for God. 
And we have to reach out. We have to touch them. We have to minister to them. We have to grab them when they're young. Now, 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 34, verse 3, listen carefully. During the eighth year of Josiah's reign, while he was still young, and if you do the math, right, he was uh, inaugurated king uh, when he was eight years old. So during his eighth year of reign, Josiah now is 16 years old. Listen to what it says. Josiah began to seek the God of his ancestor, David. Now, seeking, uh, as the Bible is describing here, uh, it's not just doing right things that please God. It's, it's, it's becoming single focused. It's, it's getting one's life centered on one main thing, the most important thing, having an intimate relationship with God. And this record, this account, man, it just sounds, sends goosebumps down my spine because an eight-year-old restoring a fallen kingdom in righteousness and godliness. And when this young boy reaches the age of 16, he sets his heart to seek God above all things. And this was not a half-hearted seeking. It wasn't just a special interest in the things of God, but it was concerted effort on Josiah's part to go deep with God, to drink in the wonders of the Lord. At age 16, and in choosing to seek the Lord, God used Josiah in such a powerful way, literally changed the course of the nation of Israel. The Bible tells us Second Chronicles, as a 20-year-old, Josiah began to purify Judah and Jerusalem by destroying all the pagan shrines and tearing down the carved uh, idols and cast uh, images uh, of false gods. And he tore down the altars of Baal in the land. He smashed them. He scattered the pieces of these altars on the graves of those who sacrificed to them. King Josiah crushed every idol from town to town, village to village, until the land was pure again and pleasing to God. And then it tells us at age 26, Josiah repairs the temple that had gone in disarray under his father's uh, kingdom, and he reestablished the worship of Yahweh, the God of Israel, the one true God of the universe. And during the temple renovations, it's a great story, they found the scrolls of the written law of God, and Josiah read them, and then he called all the people of Israel to gather together to hear the word of God being read and led them in a season of national repentance and reform, according to the law of God. Second Chronicles chapter 35, verses 18 to 19 gives us a glimpse of what this time was like. Never since the time of the prophet Samuel had there been such a Passover. None of the kings of Israel had even ever kept a Passover as Josiah did, involving all the priests and Levites. All the people of Jerusalem and the people from all over Judah and Israel. This Passover celebration took place in the 18th year of Josiah's reign. Well, so, you know, so much more could be said about King Josiah, but the point that I, I really want to make that started all for me was a 16 year old. Josiah made a life changing decision that not only changed the trajectory of his life, but the trajectory of God's nation of Israel. He had already been doing things that were pleasing to God, following the ways of God. But at 16, Josiah decided to seek the Lord with all his heart. Now, just imagine what God can do in and through a man, a woman, an eight-year-old, a teenager who chooses from all the things in this world to focus and train his or her heart to seek the Lord above all else. People, there is a great calling and destiny on our young people today. God is moving in a powerful way in those generations, especially I'm thinking of our confirmation class. You know, uh, one of my favorite sodas growing up was 7-Up. Anybody remember a nice cold 7-Up? I tell you what, it, it, it is delicious. Every now and then I'll treat myself and, and buy one. But there are 7-Ups that I want to challenge you and our confirmation class to make a lasting impact for Jesus Christ in this world that we live, to, to find and answer God's call and destiny in your life. Here's the first one. Wake up. 
emergency rooms and urgent care are seeing waves of accidental injuries that they've never seen before. These are people who are walking while so absorbed in texting and checking their Facebook on their cell phones that they're falling, they're stepping in the poles, they're getting hit by cars with drivers even texting. <laughs> Don't live your lives staring at a screen, self-consumed, self-focused, self-absorbed. Psalms 57 verse 8 says, wake up my soul. Romans chapter 13 says, besides this, knowing the time, it's already the hour for you to wake up from sleep. Listen, folks, you know, we live in critical times, dangerous times, not just overseas, but right here at home. Drug addiction, opiate overdose, crime, violence. But these times in which we live, they are ripe and filled with opportunities to touch and impact people's lives for Jesus Christ. We just have to wake up to them. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, the Apostle Paul writes, inspired by God, so then be very careful how you live. Don't live like foolish people, but like wise people. Make the most of your opportunities because these days are evil. <laughs> Young people, people of all ages, wake up to the needs around you. Wake up to the opportunities that God puts in your path every day. Seize the day. Grab it and live it to its fullness for Christ. Wake up. Here's the second of the seven ups. Dress up. I'm not talking about your fashion outfits, your polos, your Tommy Hilfinger, Pradas, whatever you wear to school or church. The Bible says in Romans chapter 13, 14, that we are to put on Christ, that we're to be clothed in him, in humility, grace, and love. Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3, 12, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and loved, put on heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, accepting one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has complaint against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Above all, put on love, that perfect bond of unity. We're to dress up in Christ. The Bible also tells us, in fact, it commands us to put on the full armor of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, put on all the armor that God supplies. In this way, you can take a stand against the devil's strategies. Then it lists the armor, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, shoes of the gospel, shield of faith. The word of God is your sword. So people dress up. Put on Christ. Put on the full armor of God. The third of the seven ups is listen up. Playing football and sports uh, growing up, my coaches used to yell in the locker room, listen up. And man, you, you better stop what you're doing and full attention on coach. Well, God wants us to listen up. Our lives are so filled with noise and distractions. And if we're going to make a difference in the kingdom of God, we have to every once in a while be quiet, get focused, and listen to the quiet voice of the Holy Spirit. Psalm chapter 46, verse 10 says, be still and know that I'm God. In other words, listen up. Get quiet in my presence. Unplug, detach, remove any and all distractions and know me. Listen so the Holy Spirit can lead you and guide you. Every one of us is hearing this. We need to listen up, especially young people. Listen up to God. The fourth of the seven ups is stand up. Stand up for what you believe in, for what you know to be right and true. In Psalm chapter 94, verse 16, God asks, who will stand up for me? against evil? Who will speak for me in this generation? Who will stand with me against the powers of darkness and oppression? Wherever you are, wherever you go, stand up for Christ. Generations ago, the church sang, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross, 
lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss from victory unto victory. His army shall he lead till every foe is vanquished. And Christ is Lord indeed. Very wise man once told me, Bill, you must stand for something or you'll fall for anything. I want to pass that on to you. You must stand for something or you'll fall for anything. Stand up for Jesus Christ. I had a seminary professor, seminary professor who instructed us in the class, no matter where we were, who we were talking to, he said, he said this, always put in a good word about Jesus. Work Jesus into your conversations. Make it a habit, and soon it will become natural for you to stand up for Jesus. Galatians chapter 6, 9 through 10, it says, let us not grow weary in doing good. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good. As we have opportunity, stand up for Jesus Christ. Put in a good word for him. Even when we're tired, we feel down. We feel rejected. Our, our faith is mocked by our friends. Maybe we're made fun of. That's the time we need to stand up. Don't grow weary. Don't give in. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Don't quit. You can do it. Stand up for Jesus Christ. The fifth of the seven ups is this one, fill up. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled up and keep on being filled up with the power, love, and grace of the Holy Spirit. Listen, you're not going to make a dent in this world if you're not constantly, daily, moment to moment, being filled with the Holy Spirit. You just won't. None of us is strong enough. You know, this Sunday... Is Pentecost Sunday, when the body of Christ, the church around the world, celebrates the day Jesus baptized his disciples of the Holy Spirit there in the upper room and filled them with the power of God, and they went out and turned their world upside down for Jesus Christ. <laughs> we need the same power. We need to be filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit. Fill up with God. See, the harsh reality is we can't even live this Christian life. We can't even be a true follower of Jesus in our own power and strength. We just can't. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to be baptized and filled and filled again until we're overflowing with God. And listen, one of the ways we do that is by keeping our eyes on Jesus. When we stay focused on Jesus, we can accomplish great things for God in the kingdom. When we look to Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, it means we take our eyes off of our weaknesses and our problems and our troubles and our circumstances. We do it. God will use us to do the impossible. When we fill up with the Holy Spirit, we see things as God sees them. And how does he see those mountains? Oh, they're just a molehill. Nothing's impossible. Nothing's impossible to God. In fact, the Apostle Paul filled up with the Holy Spirit, writes Philippians chapter 4, 13. He said, I can do all things through Christ who makes me strong. Fill up. You know, one of the best ways to fill up is worship, getting into the presence of God, drawing strength and comfort from his presence and prayer, reading and studying the scriptures, the word of God, the Bible. Fill up. Fill up with the Holy Spirit. Here's the six of the seven ups. Reach up. Reach up for something higher for your life. Dream a great big dream for your life. Reach up for your destiny in Christ. I don't know all the plans and hopes that you have today, but what you want is to reach up for something bigger and better. I don't know what you want to be in talking to young people uh, when you get older, but I know this, God has something more for you, far beyond what you could even imagine. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, the word of God says, glory belongs to God whose power is at work in us, and by this power, he can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Do you have a great imagination? Can you dream big dreams? God says, I can dream bigger. I can do more with your life than you can even imagine if you just reach up to me. And all we have to do is reach up and say, Lord, I'm all in on your plans for me. Show me and I'll do it. 
Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Reach up to God. Finally, seven of the seven ups. Lift up. Lift up. God didn't create you and put you in this world to live for yourself. You were created for a mission, the mission of Jesus Christ. And part of that mission is to serve to lift up the downtrodden, to lift up the hurting, to lift up the outcast, to lift up the needy. In John chapter 4, verse 35, Jesus says this to his disciples, I say to you, lift up your eyes and see the fields that they are white unto harvest already. Jesus wasn't talking about the wheat, the barley. He was saying, lift up your eyes and see this ocean of people who are hurting and who need God and want to know him but they have no one to tell him. The Bible says we're to lift up Jesus Christ in our lives and all that we do, because Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. You know, I found that most people really don't care much for religion, but they sure love Jesus. So lift up Jesus in your life. And just for the record, Jesus didn't come to earth to start a new religion. He came to earth to build and pave a new relationship with God through his death and resurrection. So don't share religion. Share Jesus with people. Lift up what he has done for you and invite them along in the journey and adventure of following Jesus Christ. Lift up people and build them up. Don't tear people down. Stop putting people down. Don't be critical and judgmental. Be an encourager. Be a person people like to be around because of your faith and positive attitude. Lift people up. The Bible, you know, also tells us to lift up our cares to the Lord in prayer. That's important. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says, do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And the peace of God that passes understanding will rule your heart. You know, I found when working with people can be very uh, tough. It can be discouraged. Some people aren't lovable. And you need a prayer life. You need to lift up your own heartbreak and get God's peace. So real quickly, let's bounce through them one more time. The seven ups of impacting the world for Jesus Christ, finding your destiny and your calling. First, we need to wake up, be alert to the opportunities that God gives us every day. We dress up. We put on Jesus Christ. Be clothed in him. Put on the armor of God. We listen up. We we listen every day to the voice of God through the Holy Spirit, through the word of God. Let him guide you, and we stand up for him. We stand bold for Jesus Christ, and we fill up with the Holy Spirit every day, overflowing with him, and we reach up and dream big dreams for God, and we lift up. We lift up the people around us as we are the hands and feet of Christ serving in a needy world. Hey, let's pray. Father, thank you for the challenge of your word. Thank you for these seven ups. Wake up, dress up, listen up, stand up, fill up, reach up, lift up. God, may we do them. May we do them in your power and your grace to reach not only this needy world, but to fulfill our destiny in Christ. You're calling upon our life. There's nothing more that we want to do is when we get to heaven to hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. Well, before we dismiss, it's time for us to take communion. So if you have your elements ready, take your bread. Jesus, on the night of uh, Passover, before his arrest and crucifixion, took bread and he blessed it, thanked God for it, and then he broke it and he gave it to his disciples to eat and said, here, this is my body. Take and eat, for this is my flesh broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, your broken body was broken for our healing, spiritual, emotional, and physical healing. So as we take this bread, become for us 
let it become for us your body and bring healing in every area of our life. Let's take and eat the bread. Later on in the Passover meal, he took a cup of wine. He blessed it and gave thanks to God for it. And then he gave it to his disciples and said, take and drink this, all of you, for this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. A new covenant, a new relationship with God through my blood. Let's take this blood now, take the cup and appropriate it. Ask God to forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness and receive the forgiveness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us drink. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your Holy Spirit in our life. Be strong in us. We want to be world changers, and we know that begins with us. Help us be the men, the women, the young people, even the children that you want us to be. As we grow and mature in Christ, keep us focused. Help us to remember to wake up and be alert to the opportunities that you put in our ways, to put on you, Lord, to put on Lord Jesus and the full armor of God dress up and to listen to your voice, to listen up, to stand up and be bold for you and to fill up with the Holy Spirit and to reach up and dream big dreams that you've given us, a destiny in you, and to lift up the hurting and the people around us and even our own needs, we lift them to you. We thank you in Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, peace, wholeness in Jesus Christ. Now go and be that ambassador for Christ, the hands and feet of Jesus in the world around you. They're desperately looking for him and searching for him. Bring him into that situation and share him with others. God bless you. And again, look forward to seeing you uh, next weekend. We really do love you. I'm glad you're part of this virtual family. Please come back. And again, please go to our website and uh, engage with us. We want you to be uh, part of our family and that you feel like that. So uh, contact us there. And again, we love you and God's peace and grace to you. Amen.